From San Francisco to Cape Cod, heroin, as we've been hearing, is ravaging America. And Oscar-winning filmmaker Stephen Okazaki has been covering that story for decades. In 1999, he produced the documentary Black Tar Heroin. Last year, he made the film Heroin, Cape Cod, USA. Both films provide an unflinching look at the crisis. All girls come to the city and are showered with heroin if they want it. I felt the rush and it was really, it was, it was pretty incredible, you know, it was like, that was over. That's what the, the rush is what got me. I'm bored in my life, I'm not doing anything and I started doing it again. I tell them, go home, go, get out of the city before it's too late. I just want to sleep, you know, sleep forever, you know. I just want to do that shot and be high and just go into the afterlife high. The second person you saw in that clip from the late 90s was Tracy Houghton Mitchell. She was the young woman with the cap on backwards that talked uh, about the rush. And unlike so many people, Tracy managed to get clean and then devoted her life to helping others do the same. She writes about all that in her new book, The Big Fix, and she is here with filmmaker Stephen Okazaki and The Atlantics. Something's... Oh. You isolate so much that you're alone, even if you're surrounded by people. And I know I could do things to try to fix my life, but I don't know. At times, it seems like hopeless or pointless. Nobody's going to change unless they want to change. And even if I change myself, like, you know, my mom's not going to change, my dad's not going to change, my sister's not going to change. So I don't matter, like, how much work they do for me. Our relationship stays the same. It's sick and it sucks, but it's like such a vicious cycle that people just want to give up sometimes. And they either give up and get clean or they give up and die. I mean, I don't want to die, but at the same time, I have so much shit that I never got with. And emotion, I don't want to support it. And that's why I Okay, now I think it's really over. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I, I hope people got a full sense of, of the film because it's quite incredible, or both films. Um, as I was saying, while the film was still running, the, the second clip you saw um, in, the, in the film was from the 90s. It was a woman named Tracy Helton Mitchell, and she was the one with the black cap, I mean the back cap on backwards and talked about the rush. And she managed to get clean and then devoted her life to helping others do the same. And she writes about that in her new book, The Big Fix. She is here with the filmmaker of those two movies, Stephen Okazaki and The Atlantic's Olga Kazan. That was a pretty incredible um, couple of clips that we just saw, Steve. And so the first one um, is in 1996, right, in San Francisco. We shot for two years in, uh, from 96 to 98 uh, in San Francisco, right? Okay. And the second one is in Cape Cod, right? In, and that was, it was just recently. Just recently we shot from middle of... 2014 to middle towards the end of uh, 2015 so and it was just up on HBO in December okay so how did you uh, decide on on Cape Cod for the second movie well um, 
documentaries are kind of decided by what the New York Times is interested, it seems, lately. And there, there, there were several stories about uh, heroin addiction in Vermont. And uh, so, so HBO said, why don't you go up to Vermont and, and see what you can do? And I, I found I, often when something's been in the news, um, the, the low, people have gone in and done quick stories, and, and there, there was a lot of trepidation about media that, uh, when we went in, and it just didn't seem like worth the trouble to say, well, we're not, you know, NBC Dateline, we're not, you know, um, we, we want to, we'll stay, for, we want to do an in-depth piece, and we're not rushing it, we have the time and the money to do, um, to stay and really look at the, the issue. And frankly, we just we we tried numerous locations in New England because the problem was just bad all over. It was bad in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, and in Massachusetts, and um, just ended up in Cape Cod. And we there were a few social service uh, groups there that were doing needle exchange that were open um, to sort of doing intro. But most of the most of the subjects in the film just came from talking. Um, there's a parents group that was very involved, and we met some of the kids through their parents, and um, just met other addicts through other addicts. I see. And what did you notice was similar or maybe different about the two time periods that you looked at? And how were the epidemics different from one another? Well, in in the '90s when we were shooting in San Francisco. And you know the first interview we do is sort of get their history, and lots of the kids' history. We had about ten kids. Their history was just horrendous uh, amount of uh, abuse, parental abuse, neglect, uh, sexual abuse, and in so many cases. And you know there are a few kids that were just sort of tra chasing the sort of high in a kind of high school way, looking for a better high, looking for ways to be different and be cool and then got caught up in it. But a lot of the kids just had these profiles where you thought, well, if, that, if I had that background, heroin wouldn't be, maybe, you know, was, uh, was a welcome escape. Um, I think, you know, when we were doing it in Cape Cod, um, there, there was much less of that. I felt like, um, well, I, I think when you look at the profiles, though, of the, of the kids in San Francisco in the 90s, though, the stuff they say, it's, you know, it's, they're sort of just talking about teenage angst, you know, or just the pain of being that young, of having issues with your parents. And I, I think that's the sort of uniting thing, is that for a lot, it's, I mean, I, I think people forget that, you know, deciding to, to take, take heroin, you know, when you're 14 or, or even 20 is not the same process when you're 30. It's just, it's not a, a decision that you're making intelligently. You're, you know, you're, it's coming from a lot of pain that may be, may be just of the moment or maybe, you know, maybe it's lifelong, you know, emotional pain. But in many of the cases, the kids are just going through life. And, and Tracy, you were in that first film, and how, how old were you when you were in that? Uh, it was filmed from 1995 to 1997, so the film ended when I was 27, and I got clean, um, I got off drugs a few months later. Oh, okay, so it was sort of toward the end of your, your addiction. Yes, okay. it, was very, it was the very end, and it's very evident in the film. And, and so tell, tell us, I mean, for people who don't, who aren't familiar with this kind of process? How how did you go to become addicted, and then sort of what was the process uh, leading into your addiction? I guess how did you maybe what was the process leading up to the first time you tried heroin, and then why did you keep doing it? Um, so I had a decent growing up. I had a really supportive mother, um, but I had um, you know speaking on the subject of today of the day, I had a history of mental health. Issues, so I don't like to use the term mental illness, but I had been diagnosed with having major depression at 12 years old, and I, you know, my first addiction was really food. Um, I was a compulsive overeater, and because of that, I dealt with a lot of bullying growing up, and I was very sort of depressed and within myself. And I remember being 17 years old. Um, I was going to an Ursuline Academy. I was an honor student, and I had my teeth pulled. 
And you know, at the time, people were sort of experimenting appropriately with alcohol or marijuana, but I really wasn't interested in that. But I remember the feeling that the opioids gave me, and I sort of bookmarked that for later in life. And so I went to school at the University of Cincinnati, and I had gotten in this really tumultuous relationship. And when that relationship ended, um, I started experimenting with opioids that people were getting as they normally do at that age from the medicine cabinets um, from their parents that were left over from surgeries. And I was very, very naive at the time. I wasn't aware of sort of the effects that opioids would have, especially um, the first time I ever had to kick an opioid. Um, I was sweating and my muscles locked up and I had begged my friend to suffocate me um, because I wanted to die. And he said, no, you're just kicking. And I was like, I didn't even know what kicking was. No one could even explain that to me. Uh, and then um, a few uh, you know, months went on and then I started um, using heroin. And so a huge difference now between then is that heroin was very difficult to acquire as opposed to now where it's cheaper than a mixed drink and it's twice as potent. Um, and so um, I, it's, you know, within a few months, uh, I, was, I came out to San Francisco on spring break and I never left. I became a street level junkie um, there living in alleyways and um, sort of living a marginal existence of polysubstance use. Uh, and when the film ended, I was really in pre-contemplation. Uh, there was a part that wasn't in there. I had tried to get on methadone treatment. Um, I had tried various kinds of um, interventions, but there wasn't the kind of treatment available as there is now. Um, options were very, very limited to like jail, methadone, or kicking cold turkey. Um, and so I went into, I got arrested for the 11th time, and I kicked for the 11th time. Um, and I went into a uh, residential treatment facility that was very, uh, w it wasn't a very good one, um, but I actually made it out of there. It was for cr criminal offenders. It was actually closed because the success rate was so low that the criminal justice system pulled the funding um, from it. Uh, and so I um, went into then, I lived in sober living run by the Salvation Army for four years, and I, so I've been uh, a person in recovery for 18 years, and that's, um, 15 of that is what's captured in my book, The Big Fix. So I really wanted to give people um, sort of like my process of going through recovery as opposed to an addiction memoir where people just talk about shooting drugs, and then the last chapter is, and then I went to rehab and I'm clean, the end. Right, and I wanted to bring up something really interesting that you said backstage, which is that you actually run a, a naloxone program out of your closet, your personal closet at home, right? Yeah, so I'm married with three kids and I work, for, I work um, in county services in San Francisco, California. Uh, but years ago, San Francisco became the first county to do um, uh, worth a prescribing doc did naloxone. And I had a period of time where I, I quit working with naloxone services, but then um, years ago, uh, people were contacting me. I do a lot of work through social media um, con connecting with users, especially young users, and people were saying that they were looking for naloxone but couldn't find it anywhere, and I knew people that had it or um, had access to it, and so I started running a naloxone pl program basically out of my closet. It was fairly illegal at the time. Now it's pretty much legal, um, sort of legal, uh, but I felt really compelled to do it because, you, you know, so many young people are, and, and so many people in general are dying, and so the program that I've been running through my closet has saved uh, 171 lives that are documented. There's, you know, another, uh, you know, a few hundred vials of naloxone that are not accounted for that probably have saved people's lives. They just didn't report it back to me. Um, so I'm a huge advocate of naloxone, and I work um, locally and at the federal level um, advocating for the affordable and um, available naloxone for everyone in the United States. Wow. Um, so I'm sure you guys um, might have some questions for them, so let's take it to the audience. Back there, yeah. Hi, my name is Carol McDade. I'm with Capital Decisions, and I'm also a person in long-term recovery. And for me, that means I also have 18 years uh, free from alcohol and drugs. This is not a very cool and slick comment, but I feel like it's got to be made. Um, the graphics and some of the video clips you saw, um, even with 18 years clean, it still makes my stomach flip. Is there any way, I understand that these are compelling and graphic videos and pieces that are trying to intentionally get people's attention. But is there a way that we could have a happy medium so that there's some kind of warning on there 
because um, it was making my stomach flip and I've got 18 years clean. Just, just wanted to see how we could both be compelling and protect people's recovery because it does cause cravings. Thank you. I actually wonder about how do you balance um, in, your, in your films the telling the story of the addicts um, without glorifying what they're doing? Well, uh, I, I, I don't think there's, there's ever an issue of glorifying it. I think, you know, you, you try to show the daily life, which is fairly mundane of a addict. I mean, well, um, just, just getting, the, using, getting the drug, using the drug, and hustling for money to get it, to use it again. Um, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing with um, making a film, one, just about heroin addicts, but uh, with needles in it, because needles are probably the biggest phobia uh, that exists. And we, in fact, actually, um, for the last film, not a, there's not a single puncture in the whole film, but everyone thinks it's loaded with punctures because people cringe and look away at the moment, but um, there's not actually an injection in the film because people are so nervous about it. I, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, it, you're watching, uh, I mean, if in this situation, um, maybe it's a surprise, but if you're watching a film about heroin addicts um, and to not, you know, to censor it in any way seems to me um, not the choice I would make, so I apologize, but We'll, we would still make the same film. So I would just say, speaking to your point, um, when I was, one of the things in, in writing my book, I was very, very concerned about that because I remember being like 15 or 16 and you read sort of addiction-based books and it, it makes you really, really interested in using drugs. Um, so, uh, so I really um, tried to, in writing the book, stay away from that. But I would say in terms of black tar heroin, he was really documenting what was happening. Um, there's a scene in black tar heroin where I was doing laundry, laundry and I remember asking him, I don't remember ever doing laundry. And he said, well, we had to film you doing something else because all you ever did was shoot up. Um, yeah. The, uh, I, I just lost my point. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? No questions yet. No. Uh, oh, over here. Yes. Uh, what do you, I mean, the microphone and Sam. Okay, I can do both. What do you say to teenagers who um, might be dealing with mental illnesses, might not, but who think marijuana is now cool because it's legal in more than half of the states, or who are experimenting with it? Go forth. I try to provide, so as a moderator of a user's forum and also as a harm reduction advocate, I try to provide accurate information for people. Now, I am the mother of three children. My children know that I used to be a drug user and that I was homeless. And so I've started that process really early as opposed to them um, being blindsided later in life finding out these things about me. So I think um, having an adult or peers, uh, the, the, v, the veterans panel had talked about using peer counselors, talking about the positives and negatives because, and, and really trying to guide my children into other activities is how I'm hoping that that's going to play itself out. Um, you know, I have concerns every day, like which one of my kids is going to, is going to be a user? I and mean, people ask me all the time, what if they came home wanting to smoke marijuana? It's like I can only educate them based on my own experience. I don't want them to find out about things on the internet. I want them to find out things about from me or from someone else I trust as an educator to give them accurate information. And I can only hope that they make positive choices based on that. Um, and I think um, one of the you know, kind of concerns that I have, we talked a lot about policy decisions that are going on right now, is there's actually so little input from active users. We have policymakers, people like myself, people who are former users, we have family members, and all of that is really important. But there's so little voices of people who are actively using and us making decisions for them. Um, so one of the things I do is I ask active users through the internet and they contact me what they would like to see and then I disseminate that information through me to other places. But I think that there's, especially in the internet age, there's so many ways that um, information can be a positive thing and a negative thing that we really need to get ahead of the curve and use, and use technology to get in contact with people and get their ideas and their input as to what they would like to see happen. Yeah, over here. Um, hi, can you stand up, state your name, and make your question. 
Hi, Bhavani Hammond. Um, it, it's just in response to the other uh, uh, commenter earlier. I just thought you, uh, it's amazing what you've done. And as a disseminator of uh, information and educating the public, it's really amazing what you've done. But I just felt it was a little dismissive. It was a true uh, feeling she shared with you. Yeah. I think maybe, I know you can't not show it, but maybe put a message out to say that it's going to be hurtful to some viewers or something like that, it would be more responsible. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I, did, I didn't mean to be dismissive. I mean, I, w one thought, I mean, is w one of the appeals of, of, of uh, heroin is that it's a ritual. I mean, it, you don't just pop the pill. You don't, and it, it's important to, sh you know, that that ritual is part of its appeal. It's, it, you know, it, and it's everything is sort of built around it, so it's important to show it. It's part of the use of the drug, but yeah, it's it's a, it's a difficult thing. It can be uh, very graphic, and probably I mean I've been, uh, you know, um, I, I've watched it a lot and um, seen kids OD and and, um, and you know and I I don't you know to me always what what the horrible thing is just the daily I mean. I mean, I could imagine taking a drug that, you know, that allows you to escape, you know, uh, for a couple hours. I can't imagine the daily hustle of then, you know, every day having to go through this, you know, long ordeal of whatever petty crime of court or stealing from your parents or, you know, um, however, or dealing or anything. Every single day, I mean, it, the, it always befuddles me, the balance of, what you know, the addiction, and which tells you that the addiction is so powerful, you know, people w um, would demean themselves. And I, I think what's striking though now is how much you know the modern era we live in um, plays into this. I mean, you can, you can, most kids get their drugs via the iPhone. You don't have to go to the creepy part of town and walk up to a creepy guy. You know, you just call, and it's probably somebody you know. A, you know, friend you knew in high school or something. He's dealing to keep his habit going or to make a little money, and so it's not. It's 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 incredibly. Everything is incredibly accessible. I mean, when we started the research for the film, I you know I was struck by looking at ads at you know in nineteen in the turn of the century twentieth century for bear aspirin, and they said. You know, you looked at them and said they Bear as Bear was announcing its new products, aspirin and heroin, and send away for free samples. And there were other ads that said, you know, that showed children said, you know, uh, um, heroin for children. Heroin cough drops. And and you look at that and you just go, oh, how ridiculous! But now that actually has come true. We have opiates are accessible. Uh, Incredible to children, very easily. They're in most, you know, medicine cabinets, and most of the kids, you know, the difference of the two in the 20 years is most of the kids in the current film started, you know, with Vicodin, Percocet, that they either got. Several kids, two kids, were in serious car accidents. Another, two others had light, uh, well, had serious uh, sports injuries, but you know, just and they just got these bottles, and the doctor said, you know, just take them every. This many and huge bottles, you know, and uh, and you've all, you know, most people have gotten those prescriptions. You just go, you take three of them, and then you know you don't need them anymore. But these are children, you know, and these these are people that can't really make that judgment, and um, and their friends go, did, what did you get when you you know for that broken arm? And they go, you know, this is what you ought to do with it, and it's that's inescapable. Every kid is going to hear that. Um. Well, there's certainly a lot to this, and we could talk for several more hours, I'm sure. That's our time, but thank you both so much for being here today. Thank you.